Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Aliens Among Us The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Too Many Eggs by Chris Neville Flight 18 by Paul A. Torak Second Census by John Victor Peterson The Scapegoat by Richard Maples The Eyes Have It by Philip K. Dick Originally published in Science Fiction Stories 1953 Narrated by Tom Trissel It was quite by accident I discovered this incredible invasion of Earth by life forms from another planet. As yet, I haven't done anything about it. I can't think of anything to do. I wrote to the government, and they sent back a pamphlet on the repair and maintenance of frame houses. Anyhow, the whole thing is known. I'm not the first to discover it. Maybe it's even under control. I was sitting in my easy chair, idly turning the pages of a paper-backed book someone had left on the bus when I came across the reference that first put me on the trail. For a moment I didn't respond. It took some time for the full import to sink in. After I'd comprehended, it seemed odd I hadn't noticed it right away. The reference was clearly to a non-human species of incredible properties not indigenous to Earth. A species, I hasten to point out, customarily masquerading as ordinary human beings. Their disguise, however, became transparent in the face of the following observations by the author. It was at once obvious the author knew everything, knew everything, and was taking it in his stride. The line, and I tremble remembering it even now, read, His eyes slowly roved about the room. Vague chills assailed me. I tried to picture the eyes. Did they roll like dimes? The passage indicated not. They seemed to move through the air, not over the surface. Rather rapidly, apparently. No one in the story was surprised. That's what tipped me off. No sign of amazement at such an outrageous thing. Later, the matter was amplified. His eyes moved from person to person. There it was, in a nutshell. The eyes had clearly come apart from the rest of him and were on their own. My heart pounded and my breath choked in my windpipe. I had stumbled on an accidental mention of a totally unfamiliar race, obviously non-terrestrial. Yet, to the characters in the book it was perfectly natural, which suggested they belonged to the same species. And the author, a slow suspicion burned in my mind, the author was taking it rather too easily in his stride. Evidently, he felt this was quite a usual thing. He made absolutely no attempt to conceal this knowledge. The story continued. Presently, his eyes fastened on Julia. Julia, being a lady, had at least the breeding to feel indignant. She is described as blushing and knitting her brows angrily. At this, I sighed with relief. They weren't all non-terrestrials. The narrative continues. Slowly, calmly, his eyes examined every inch of her. Great Scott! But here the girl turned and stomped off and the matter ended. I lay back in my chair, gasping with horror. My wife and family regarded me in wonder. What's wrong, dear? My wife asked. I couldn't tell her. Knowledge like this was too much for the ordinary run-of-the-mill person. I had to keep it to myself. Nothing, I gasped. I leapt up, snatched the book, and hurried out of the room. In the garage, I continued reading. There was more. Trembling, I read the next revealing passage. He put his arm around Julia. Presently, she asked him if he would remove his arm. He immediately did so, with a smile. It's not said what was done with the arm after the fellow had removed it. Maybe it was left standing upright in the corner. Maybe it was thrown away. I don't care. 
In any case, the full meaning was there, staring me right in the face. Here was a race of creatures capable of removing portions of their anatomy at will. Eyes, arms, and maybe more, without batting an eyelash. My knowledge of biology came in handy at this point. Obviously, they were simple beings, unicellular, some sort of primitive single-cell things, beings no more developed than starfish. Starfish can do the same thing, you know. I read on, and came to this incredible revelation, tossed off coolly by the author without the faintest tremor. Outside the movie theatre we split up. Part of us went inside, part over to the café for dinner. Binary fission, obviously. Splitting in half and forming two entities. Probably each lower half went to the café, it being farther, and the upper halves to the movies. I read on, hands shaking. I had really stumbled onto something here. My mind reeled as I made out this passage. I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. Poor Bibney has lost his head again. Which was followed by, And Bob says he has utterly no guts. Yet Bibney got around as well as the next person. The next person, however, was just as strange. He was soon described as totally lacking in brains. There was no doubt of the thing in the next passage. Julia, whom I had thought to be the one normal person, reveals herself as also being an alien life form, similar to the rest. Quite deliberately, Julia had given her heart to the young man. It didn't relate what the final disposition of the organ was, but I didn't really care. It was evident Julia had gone right on living in a usual manner, like all the others in the book, without heart, arms, eyes, brains, viscera, dividing up in two when the occasion demanded, without a qualm. Thereupon she gave him her hand. He sickened. The rascal now had her hand as well as her heart. I shuddered to think what he'd done with them by this time. He took her arm. Not content to wait, he had to start dismantling her on his own. Flushing crimson, I slammed the book shut and leapt to my feet, but not in time to escape one last reference to those carefree bits of anatomy whose travels had originally thrown me on the track. Her eyes followed him all the way down the road and across the meadow. I rushed from the garage and back inside the warm house, as if the accursed things were following me. My wife and children were playing Monopoly in the kitchen. I joined them and played with frantic fervour, brow feverish, teeth chattering. I had had enough of the thing. I want to hear no more about it. Let them come on. Let them invade Earth. I don't want to get mixed up in it. I have absolutely no stomach for it. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Too Many Eggs by Chris Neville Writing as Chris Melville Originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction November 1962 Narrated by Tom Trisser Everybody likes fried eggs for breakfast, but would a chicken? Cox, an unusually phlegmatic citizen, came to buy the new refrigerator in the usual fashion. He was looking for a bargain. It was the latest model, fresh from the new production line in Los Angeles, and was marked down considerably below standard. The freezing compartment held 245 pounds of meat. How come so cheap? Cox wanted to know. Frankly, the salesman said, I asked myself that. Usually there's a dent in them or something, when they have that factory tag on them. But I checked it over and I can't find anything wrong with it. However, she goes as is. At that price, Cox said, I'll take it. It arrived, refinished in a copper colour to his specifications the following Tuesday. It was plugged in and operated perfectly. He checked it out by freezing ice cubes. Wednesday evening, when he opened the door to chill some beer, there was a package in the freezing compartment. He took out the package. It was some sort of plastic and appeared to contain fish eggs. 
Cox had not seen fresh fish eggs, considered by some a delicacy for a number of years. He chilled the beer and fried the eggs. Both tasted about right. The following Friday, his girlfriend came over to fix dinner for him, and when she looked in the freezing compartment, she said, What's this? Fish eggs, Cox said. How many of them? Two packages. We'll fry them up for breakfast, he said. Saturday morning, there were three packages of eggs in the refrigerator. Where do they come from? His girlfriend wanted to know. They just appear. I ate some, and they're very good. She was reluctant, but he talked her into preparing a package. She agreed. They were very good. What are you going to do about it? she asked. I don't think there's anything to do about it, he said. I like fish eggs. On Sunday, the package they had eaten Saturday had been replaced. They were coming in at a steady rate of one a day. Cox cooked a package for breakfast and took the other two to his parents. By Tuesday, he was getting tired of the eggs, and by the end of the week he had four more packages. He succeeded in giving two packages to the neighbours. At the end of another week, he had eight packages. He explained to his girlfriend. She suggested they all visit their friends, leaving a package with each of them. At the end of another two weeks, this method for disposing of the eggs had worn thin. They finally managed to give the last two packages to the landlady. At the end of still another week, there were seven more packages. Otherwise, the refrigerator was a good buy. Cox calculated that, at the present rate, had he left the packages in the compartment, it would have been filled by the end of the month. He felt that once that point was reached, the eggs would stop coming. Should this prove to be incorrect, he was prepared to arrange for some method of commercial distribution for the product. On schedule, the eggs stopped coming. He waited two days. No more came. It was over. He ate the last package. The refrigerator worked perfectly and began to stock it with things freezers are conventionally stocked with. It was almost two weeks after the last package had appeared early one Sunday morning when the doorbell rang. At the door was a small, nondescript man with a vaguely and really indefinably unpleasant aspect. His head was bandaged. Mr. Cox, he asked. That's me. May I come in? Come on. The man seated himself. Something terrible has happened, he said. A horrible mistake has been made. I'm sorry to hear that. You look as if you were in an accident. I was. I've been in the... hospital for nearly two months. But to come to the point, Mr. Cox, I've come about the refrigerator you recently purchased. It was a special refrigerator that was erroneously shipped out of the plant as a second. When I didn't come in, it got shipped out and sold. Good refrigerator, Cox said. Perhaps you've noticed, ah, uh, something unusual about it? It runs okay. For a while there were a bunch of packages of fish eggs in it. Fish eggs? The little man cried in horror. After he had recovered sufficiently, he asked, You do? Of course you do. I'm sure you still have all the little packages? Oh, no, said Cox. No? Oh, my God! What did you do with them, Mr. Cox? Ate them. You ate them? Ate? No, you didn't. Not all of them. You couldn't have done that, Mr. Cox. Please tell me that you could not have done that. Well, I had to give a lot of them away, and everybody said they were delicious. And really, uh, Mr. Mm, Mr. Uh, the little man got unsteadily to his feet. His face was ashen. This is horrible, horrible. He stumbled to the door. You are a fiend. All our work, all our plans. And you, you, he turned to Cox. I hate you. Oh, I hate you. Now see here. Mr. Cox, you'll never realize the enormity of your crime. You've eaten all of us. With that, he slammed the door and was gone. Cox went back to the other room. Who was it, honey? Ah, some nut. Seems he had the first claim on the refrigerator. I bet it was about the fish eggs. Yeah, he wanted them. 
Oh, dear, do you think he can do anything to us? I don't think so, not now. It's too late, Cox concluded. We ate them all. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Flight 18 by Paul A. Torak Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, August 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser Mr. Bradbury was angry. Fog or no fog, the airlines should stay on schedule. Lack of planning, foresight, sense of responsibility, that was a trouble. He felt like cursing. Damn, said Mr. Bradbury. But a voice on the public address system announced that Flight 18 for Chicago was ready to leave. He raised his considerable bunk from the chair in the dimly lit waiting room of the airfield and checked his watch. No way to run a business. He shook his head and snorted indignantly. Such a snort is worthy of note. It was an utterance that could be made only by a corporation lawyer in the prime of life. It was a nasal explosion connoting wealth, confidence and a singular lack of imagination. It was a snort fed on T-bone steaks, good scotch whisky and bicarbonate of soda. Mr. Bradbury peered myopically around the waiting room. A few minutes ago, while washing his face in the men's room, he had broken his glasses in the washbowl. Although he hated to admit it to anyone, he could see next to nothing without those thick lenses. The room was an unpleasant blur, but he was able to determine that he was the only would-be passenger in the waiting room. The others were drinking coffee in the airfield's restaurant. Flight 18, said the voice on the speaker. Flight 18. Mr. Bradbury shrugged his heavy shoulders, picked up his bag and briefcase, and stepped out the door into the fog. The mist hung thick and low over the airfield, cloaking the damp night air in a morbid blanket of gloom. Mr. Bradbury blinked suddenly into the shroud-like vapour. What the hell, he swore. Can't even see the plane, and he thought, floundering unhappily into a wire gate wherein blazes are the rest of the passengers. Are they going to fly through this stuff? This way, sir said a feminine voice, and he saw a dim, uniformed figure in front of him. The hostess. Glad someone knows where he's going, he thought, and then he followed the girl toward the now visible lights of the plane. Watch your step, sir, she said as he walked up the runway. He grunted, making these things steeper all the time, he thought. The hostess was a pretty, dark-eyed young thing, plump in the right sort of way. Mr. Bradbury leaned back in the soft, cushioned seat. It felt good. Fasten your safety belt, sir. She helped him with it. And I do hope you'll be comfortable, she said in a soft, low voice. He caught the glint of black eyes, jet and sparkling. He smiled at her, appreciatively. I'm sure I will, he grinned, resisting a sudden impulse to pinch her cheek. The girl walked down the aisle toward the door again, hips swaying provocatively. A young blossom ready for the plucking, thought Mr. Bradbury. A succulent young partridge ready for the... Mr. Bradbury chuckled to himself happily on thinking of the many women he had known in his fifty years. He looked around the plane. No passengers except for a pleasant-looking young man sitting across the aisle from him a young man thoroughly engrossed in a small paper-bound book, the title of which Mr. Bradbury could not discern. He wished he had his glasses, for he was getting a slight headache. The lawyer leaned back in the soft seat and closed his eyes. Well, headache or no headache, life was good, and he was glad he was alive. Then Mr. Bradbury fell asleep. When he awoke, the plane was in flight, and looking out the window he could see nothing but darkness broken only by an occasional cloud formation. The man across the aisle was staring into the blackness outside, the book he had been reading discarded and left lying on the floor. Mr. Bradbury stretched himself and looked around him. The plane had been darkened and apparently only he and the young man were awake. He yawned. A great conversationalist, 
Mr. Bradbury craved discourse. But where was the opening wedge necessary to break the bond of silence between him and the other passenger? Then his eyes fell on the book lying on the floor. He picked it up and held it close so that he could see. The title had something to do with flying saucers, and the cover illustration, a lurid affair, showed a green-skinned, globe-headed, tentacled creature equipped with a tiny rocket motor on its back, an expression of what was supposed to pass for lust in his face. The thing was carrying away a beautiful, thinly clad earth girl, her face contorted with fear. In the background hung a disc-shaped spaceship hovering over a burning earth city. Rubbish, said Mr. Gradbury in a loud voice so that the young man across the aisle would hear him. I beg your pardon, asked the other passenger, turning away from the window, eyebrows raised in question. The book you're reading, answered the corporation lawyer. Rubbish! The smooth-faced young man blushed and smiled apologetically. Well, I suppose you're right, but it's sort of fun, you know, reading this sort of thing. The lawyer chuckled condescendingly and shook his head. He turned the book over in his hands almost fondly. He wished he had his glasses so that he could read it. It's sort of refreshing, if you know what I mean, continued the man as if feeling some further defence of his choice in literature were necessary. Rubbish, chuckled Mr. Bradbury for the third time. A shadow of annoyance registered on the young man's face. The lawyer put down the book and extended his hand across the aisle. Bradbury is the name, he said. Represent the Hotchkiss Oil Industries. Oil is my business, he added impressively. The young man hesitated for a moment, then accepted Mr. Bradbury's hand. The lawyer reflected momentarily that for a frail-looking young fellow the chap showed an amazing strength in his handshake. Tarkas is my name, said Mr. Bradbury's new acquaintance, Oswald Tarkas. In business, Mr. Tarkas? Well, no, laughed Mr. Tarkas nervously. Not exactly. I suppose you might say that I just sort of putter around. I work for a museum. Mr. Bradbury frowned. He had never known anyone who just sort of puttered around in museums. He wasn't quite sure that he approved. Such an occupation seemed vaguely un-American, subversive, although he couldn't quite say why. A museum? What museum? Oswald Tarkas hesitated, looked at the floor, and then answered almost timidly, as if he expected some reprimand. Well, it's probably not too well known. The Canal City Museum. Hmm, muttered the lawyer. No, can't say that I've heard of it. Where is it? New York? San Francisco? Oswald Tarkas had turned away for a moment and was staring out the window. The motors of the plane hummed pleasantly, giving a sense of comforting power. The plane's cabin was dark, except for the lights over in Mr. Tarkas and Mr. Bradbury's seats. Oh no, replied Mr. Tarkas. We do have our branches in those cities, but it's a bit difficult to pin us down. We're more or less a research outfit. A sort of an international organisation, if you know what I mean. Mr. Bradbury didn't, but he nodded his head agreeably. "'And what do you do for the museum, Tarkas?' he asked. "'Well, I'm what you might call a collector. Of sorts,' he added. "'Yes, I sort of collect things in a way, you might say.' The lawyer, a great student of human character, noted that his new acquaintance wore a crew-cut, his face was thin and looked clean-cut except for a slight weakness about the chin. "'Well now, Oswald,' he said, "'you don't mind my calling you Oswald, do you? I like to be friendly.' "'Not at all,' flushed Mr. Tarkas happily. "'I like to be friendly too, when my work permits,' he added. "'I have a lot of respect for museums,' ventured Mr. Bradbury. He had never been in a museum." Cultural institutions, that sort of thing. He went on, waving his hand. My company often makes contributions to worthy institutions. Maybe I can do something for your outfit. Oswald Tarkas seemed appreciative. Now that's awfully kind, and, you know, we accept all contributions gratefully. We take what we can get. 
There was an embarrassed pause in the conversation. Then Mr. Bradbury remembered the book he held in his hand. "'This book!' he said, holding it up in his hand. "'Nonsense!' he scoffed, shaking his head. "'Know what the flying saucers really were?' "'Well,' started Oswald, "'balloons!' "'Balloons?' "'Weather balloons!' assured Mr. Bradbury emphatically. "'Weather balloons! That's all they were!' Oswald looked as if he were about to say something, but didn't. Mr. Bradbury, obviously enjoying himself, drew two expensive cigars from his coat pocket. "'Have one?' he offered. Oswald hesitated and then accepted. He put the cigar in his breast pocket. "'But,' stammered Oswald, "'what about the witnesses, the National Guard pilot, the airliner pilots, the Army anti-aircraft observers?' The lawyer drew in the rich tobacco fumes and tilted his large, handsome head. "'Hallucinations,' he said. "'Mass hysteria!' A smile of amused indulgence lit his large, florid face. Oh, oh, what a world of fantastic notions was begun by that first atomic explosion. Now, for example, the notion that these so-called flying saucers are extraterrestrial— Mr. Bradbury waved the very idea away with a gesture of dismissal. If there are intelligent beings from another planet in control of these hypothetical spaceships, why haven't they contacted us by this time? Well, suggested Mr. Tarkas thoughtfully, maybe they have their reasons. Maybe you can't judge the actions of extraterrestrial beings by terrestrial standards of conduct. And the meteors, continued Mr. Bradbury, ignoring Oswald's last remark, the meteors make space travel impossible. Do you realise that every day our atmosphere is burning up thousands of those meteors? Do you know that just one of those meteors, the size of a pea, could smash right through the thickest armoured plate and wreck any rocket? Something small and glowing smashed into the outside of Mr. Bradbury's window and ricocheted off into space. What was that? asked Mr. Bradbury, half rising from his seat. I don't know answered Oswald, and then he added jokingly, maybe it was a meteor. The lawyer stared out the window, but still he could see nothing but blackness. He settled back into his seat again, shrugging his shoulders. Well now, he resumed, as I said, the meteors can't escape them. But, suggested Mr. Tarkas defensively, couldn't the rocket sort of scoot around them? He simpered as if embarrassed by such a ridiculous notion, and made a half-hearted gesture with his right hand that Mr. Bradbury assumed was a scooting motion. Mr. Bradbury dismissed this contention with a wave of his cigar. Just then the airliner gave a sickening lurch to the right, and something big and luminous roared past the plane. Mr. Bradbury bellowed, "'Roughest damn trip I've ever had!' "'It makes me nervous too,' said Oswald." "'Now another thing,' said the lawyer. "'This business about men from Mars.' He looked uneasily out his window. Oswald smiled. "'No truth in it?' "'None. Anyone with either a token knowledge of science knows that the Earth is the only place that can support human life.' "'But,' answered Oswald, "'suppose that planets could be inhabited by something other than human life, like that thing on the cover there?' He motioned toward the book Mr. Bradbury held. Mr. Bradbury laughed, about to explode this fallacy with another barrage of devastating logic. He was interrupted. "'Say, Brad, you don't mind my calling you Brad, do you?' "'Of course not,' smiled the lawyer affably. "'You say there's no such thing as flying saucers?' Mr. Bradbury inhaled from his cigar and shook his head. "'Hallucinations,' he said positively. "'You're sure of that? Stake my life on it!' Well, I'm sure glad of that, because for a long time now the dampness hallucination I've ever seen has been flying alongside of us. Mr. Bradbury rose from his seat, stepped across the aisle, and looked out Mr. Tarkas's window. He squinted out into the darkness. It was there all right, no wings, disc-shaped, rows of lighted windows, luminous vapour emanating from the rear. Damn! exclaimed Mr. Bradbury, and pressed the button for the stewardess. She came quickly down the darkened aisle. "'Flight 18,' she said blankly. "'Flight 18.' Mr. Bradbury stared. 
"'Did you ring, sir?' she asked. "'Good Lord, yes,' said the lawyer. "'Look!' he pointed to the window. The stewardess, plump and pretty as ever, didn't look, but with amazing strength pushed him down into his seat. "'This way, sir,' she said, smiling pleasantly. "'What's going on?' roared Mr. Bradbury, starting to rise again from his seat. "'Watch your step, sir,' answered the stewardess, giving him another shove. "'Fasten your safety belt, sir,' she said, and before the lawyer could protest again, he found himself fastened down in his seat. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she said in a soft, low voice. He caught the glint of black eyes, jet and sparkling. She turned, took one step up the aisle, and stopped. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she repeated. She stood there motionless, as if paralysed in the middle of the aisle. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she said again. "'And I do hope you'll be—' Mr. Tarkus stifled a yawn, rose from his seat, and stepped over to the girl. He reached out and twisted her ear. Her voice stopped, and her back slid open like a secret panel, revealing a maze of whirring, clicking machinery. "'What? What?' stuttered Mr. Bradbury. "'She's a—' "'A robot,' smiled Oswald Tarkus happily. He turned from his examination of the defective machinery. "'She's not a very good robot. Her vocal mechanism jams now and then, but she serves the purpose. You'll be surprised how many of you we catch this way.' Then Oswald touched a wall switch. The darkened plane blazed into light. There were no passengers on the plane other than Oswald, Mr. Bradbury, and the robot stewardess that stood silently in the aisle. Mr. Bradbury could still see the flying disc outside the window. Oswald saw the direction of his glance. "'Friend of mine,' he grinned. The lawyer looked wildly around the empty plane. "'Where? Where are the passengers?' he croaked, a numbing suspicion growing in his mind. "'No other passengers,' answered Oswald, standing there, still smiling. "'You just got in the wrong boat, Brad, old fellow.' The cabin of the airliner was changing. It was beginning to look like something very unlike an airliner cabin. The seats dissolved into walls which seemed to expand in the shape of a circular room. The large disc-shaped compartment lined with machinery, tanks and dials, glass cages of sleeping terrestrial animals. One large cage was empty. Mr. Bradbury stared at this unoccupied glass cylinder. "'Yes,' grinned Oswald, "'for you! "'But don't worry, just pass it all off as a hallucination. "'Want to see where we are, sport?' "'A panel opened in the floor, "'and Mr. Bradbury looked out into the black void of outer space, "'and there, in the centre of that panel of darkness, "'was the planet Earth, "'a tiny silver ball rapidly diminishing in size. "'What are you?' screamed Mr. Bradbury, struggling against the belt that held him in his seat. "'What are you?' "'A collector,' said Oswald Tarkas, tearing off his head and revealing underneath the disguise a small globe of bone and flesh, two glowing eyes, a mouth filled with many white, sharp teeth. "'A collector,' it repeated as the false arms and legs and torso were ripped away, revealing a shapeless green body equipped with spindly tentacles that waved obscenely at Mr. Bradbury. Of sorts, it added as it moved toward the frightened lawyer. Mr. Bradbury screamed. Rubbish, it giggled. Weather balloons, hallucinations, it chirped gaily, and writhing snake-like appendages reached out for the twisting, screaming, hysterical figure of Mr. Bradbury and through the empty reaches of the cosmos two tiny disks hurtled towards Sol's fourth planet. The End The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Second Census by John Victor Peterson Originally published in Infinity October 1957 Narrated by Tom Tudison In addition to being a genius in applied atomics, Maitland Brown's a speedster, a practical joker, and a spare-time dabbler in electronics. 
as far as speed's concerned, I had a very special reason for wanting to get home early tonight, and swift straight flight would have been perfectly okay with me. The trouble was that Brown decided that this was his night to work on Fitzgerald. Brown lifted the three-passenger jet copter, his contribution to a commuter pool, from the flight stage at Brookhaven National Laboratories in a strictly prosaic manner. Then the flight fiend in him came out with a vengeance. Suddenly, and simultaneously, he set the turbojets to full thrust and dived to treetop level. Then he started hedge-hopping toward Long Island Sound. His heavy, dark features were sardonic in the rear-view mirror. His narrowed, speculative eyes flicked to it intermittently to scan Ed Fitzgerald beside me. Brown's action didn't surprise, startle, or even frighten me at first. I'd seen the mildly irritated look in his eyes when Fitzgerald had come meandering up, late as usual, to the ship back on the stage. I'd rather expected some startling development. Provoking Ed Fitzgerald to a measurable nervous reaction was one of Brown's burning ambitions. I also had a certain positive hunch that Fitzgerald's tardiness was deliberate. In any event, my mind was ninety per cent elsewhere. Tessie, my wife, had visiphoned me from Doc Gardner's office in New Canaan just before I left my office at the labs, and had told me with high elation that we were destined to become the proud parents of quintuplets. I was, therefore, now going back bewilderedly over our respective family trees, seeking a precedent in the genes. I was shocked out of my genealogical pursuits when Brown skimmed between the tall stereo towers near Middle Island. I prayerfully looked at Fitzgerald for assistance in persuading Brown to cease and desist, but Fitzgerald was staring as imperturbably as ever at Brown's broad back, a faintly derisive smile on his face. I should have expected that. Even a major cataclysm couldn't budge Fitzgerald. I'd seen him damp an atomic pile only milliseconds from critical mass without batting an eye before, during or after. I tried to console myself, but while I knew Brown's reaction time was uncommonly fast and his years of copter flight singularly accident-free, I still could not relax, not tonight, with the knowledge that I was a prospective father of not just the first, but the first five I wanted to get home to Tessie in a hurry, certainly, but I wanted to get there all in one proud piece. Brown went from bad to worse and began kissing the copter's belly on the waves in Long Island Sound. The skipping stone effect was demoralising. Then, trying to top that, he hedge-hopped so low on the mainland that the jets blew the last stubbornly clinging leaves from every oak tree we near missed crossing Connecticut to our destination on the Massachusetts border. Fitzgerald was the only one who talked on the way. Brown was too intent on his alleged driving. I was, frankly, too scared for intelligible conversation. It wasn't until later, in fact, that I realised that Ed Fitzgerald's monologue had clearly solved a problem we were having on adjusting the new Cosmotron at the labs. We made good time tonight, Brown said, finally easing up as we neared home. Fitzgerald grinned. I found my voice after a moment, and said, It's a good thing Radar doesn't pick up objects that low, or CAA would be breathing down your fat neck. As it is, I think the cops at Litchfield have probably cast a summons to you P.O. Tray by now. That was the mayor's copter you almost clipped. Brown shrugged, as if he'd worry about it. Maybe. If it happened. He's top physicist at the labs. In addition to his abilities, that means he has connections. We dropped imperturbable Fitzgerald on his roof stage at the lower end of Nutmeg Street. Then Brown dropped a relieved me two blocks up and proceeded the five blocks to his enormous solar house at the hill's summit. I energised the passenger shaft, buttoned it to optimate descent, and dropped to first. There was a note from Tessie saying she'd gone shopping with Fitzgerald's wife, Miriam. 
so I'd start celebrating alone. I punched the servermeck for scotch on the rocks. As I sat sipping it I kept thinking about Maitland Brown. It wasn't just a recollection of the ride from Brookhaven, it was also the scotch association. I thought back to the night Tessie and I had gone up to Brown's to spend the evening, and Brown invited me to sit in a new plush chair. I sat all right, but promptly found that I was completely unable to rise, despite the fact that I was in full possession of my faculties. He'd then taken our respective wives for a midnight copter ride, leaving me to escape the chair's invisible embrace if I could. I couldn't. Luckily, he'd forgotten that his liquor cabinet was within arm's reach of the chair. I'd made devastating inroads on a pinch bottle by the time they'd returned. He switched off his psionic machine, but fast then, and didn't ever try to trap me in it again. The visiphone buzzed, and I leapt to it, thinking of Tessie out shopping in her delicate condition. I felt momentary relief, then startlement. It was Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, with fair features flushed, Fitzgerald the imperturbable one, stammering with excitement. "'Now wait a second, I said in amazement. "'Calm down, for heaven's sake. What's this about a census?' "'Well, are they taking one now?' "'By they, I presume you mean the Bureau of the Census of the U.S. Department of Commerce,' I said, trying to slow him down, while wondering what in the name of a reversed cyclotron could have jarred him so. He sputtered. "'Who else? Well, are they?' "'Not to my knowledge. They took it only last year's. Won't do it again until 1970. Why?' "'As I was trying to tell you, a fellow who said he was a census-taker was just here, and damn it, Jim, he wanted to know my considered ideas of natural resources, birth control, immigration, racial discrimination, UFOs, and half a dozen other things.' He threw the questions at me so fast I became thoroughly confused. What with me still thinking about the Cosmotron, wondering if Brownie will stop riding me before I do break down, and wondering where Miriam is. I just had to slow him down so that I could piece together the answers. Just about then he staggered as if a fifth of hundred-proof bourbon had caught up with him and reeled out without a fairly well. I didn't see which way he went because Jim Moran— He's a new fellow in the house just down the hill. Jim called to see if the fellow had been here yet, and what I thought of him. If he hit Jim's before me, that means he should be getting to you within the next half hour or so. My front door chimed. Sorry, Fitz, I said. This must be Tessie. She was coming home on the surface bus. Miriam's with her, so that's one worry off your mind. Take it easy. I'll call you back. But it wasn't Tessie. It was a man, dressed in a dark brown business suit that was tight on his big frame. His face was a disturbing one, eyes set so wide apart you had trouble meeting them up close, and felt embarrassed shifting your gaze from one to the other. "'Mr. James Rainford?' he asked rhetorically. "'Yes? I'm from the Bureau of the Census,' he said calmly. "'This couldn't be the same fellow Fitzgerald had encountered. There must be a group of them covering the neighbourhood.' In any event, this man was cold sober. Further, the fastest Olympic runner couldn't have made the two long blocks from Fitzgerald's house in the time that had elapsed, and this fellow wasn't even breathing hard. "'Let's see your credentials,' I said. I wasn't sure whether he hesitated because he couldn't remember which pocket they were in, or for some other reason. Anyway, he did produce credentials, and they were headed U.S. Department of Commerce— Bureau of the Census, and looked very proper indeed. But I still couldn't quite believe it. But the census was taken last year, I said. We have to recheck this area, he said smoothly. We have reason to believe that the records are inaccurate. His eyes were harder to meet than ever. Excuse me, I said, and stepped out on the stoop, looking down the hill towards Fitzgerald's house. Not only was Fitzgerald standing on his tropic forlorn, but so were the dozen household heads in between, each and every one of them staring fixedly at the pair of us on my stoop. "'Come in,' I said perplexedly, and led the way. When I turned to face him, 
I found that he'd swung a square black box which resembled a miniature cathode ray oscilloscope from behind his back and was busily engaged in punching multicoloured buttons tinging the dim raster. I'm a gadget man. Cybernetics is my forte. But I'm afraid I stared. The most curious waveforms I have ever seen were purple snaking across the scope. It's a combination memory storage bank and recorder, he explained. Electronic shorthand. I'm reading the data which your wife gave to us, and which I'll ask you to verify. The gadget was a new one for me. I made a mental note to renew my subscription to Scientific American. Married, he said. Ah, yes, expecting. Now will you stop right there, I cried. That couldn't be on your records. A year ago we certainly weren't expecting. Now look. But he kept on with most peculiar enthusiasm. Quintuplets, sure, three boys and two girls. My congratulations, Mr. Rainford. Thank you for your time. I stood there, dazed. Nobody but Dr. Gardiner, Tessie, and myself. Well, maybe Miriam Fitzgerald by this time knew we were expecting. Even Gardiner couldn't know the division of sexes among the fetal group at this early stage of development. I had to find a way to delay this strange man. Let's see your credentials again, I demanded as my mind raced. Oh, where's Tessie? What was it Fitz had said? Brownie? Maybe Brownie can explain. The census-taker pulled papers from his pocket, then reeled as though drunk. He staggered backward against and out of the door, the autoclose slamming it behind him. I jerked open the door and jumped out on the stoop. In those few seconds the man had vanished. No, there he was, fifty feet away, ringing Mike Kozulak's bell, and he was erect, completely steady. But nobody could move that fast. I turned back and picked up the papers he'd dropped. There was a little sheaf of them, printed on incredibly thin paper. The printing resembled the waveforms I had seen upon the scope. It was like some twisted Arabic script, and this strange script was overprinted on a star chart which I thought I recognised. I plumbed my mind. I had it! In his star identification course at MIT they had given us star charts showing us the galaxy as seen from another star which we were asked to identify. One of those charts at MIT had been almost exactly the same as this. The galaxy as viewed from Alpha Centauri. I was stunned. I staggered a bit as I went back out on the stoop and looked down the street. I welcomed the sight of Ed Fitzgerald hurrying up across a neighbour's forelawns, uprooting some of the Burbank's tropical plants en route. By the time Fitzgerald reached me, the census-taker had come out of Mike Kozlax like a fission-freed neutron, staggering a few times in an orbit around Mun and Mike's greenhouse-shelled shrubs, and actually streaked across the two vacant lots between Mike's and Manny Cohen's. "'He's not human,' I said to Ed. Not Earth human. I'll swear he's from Alpha Centauri. Look at these papers. What he's after heaven knows. But maybe we can find out. It's a cinch he'll eventually reach Maitland Browns. Let's get there fast. Maybe we'll be able to trap him. I dragged Fitzgerald inside, and we went up the passenger shaft under optimum ascent. My little ponticopter's jets seared the roof garden as I blasted forward before the vanes had lifted us clear of the stage. I think I out-browned Brown in going those five blocks, and I know I laid the foundation for a Mrs. Brown versus Mr. Rainford feud as I dropped my copter with dismaying results into the roof garden which was her idea of Eden. I had to, though. Brownies is a one-copter stage, and his ship was on it. We beat the alien. We looked back down the hill before we entered Brownies' passenger shaft. The fella was just staggering out of Jack Wall's rancher at the lower end of his last block. We found Brown working on a stripped-down stereo chassis, which had been carelessly laid without protective padding in the middle of the highly polished dining table. I knew then that his wife couldn't possibly be home. Brown looked up, as if he were accustomed to unannounced people dropping into his reception chute. To what do I owe the honour of? 
he started. Fitzgerald interrupted him with a stammered burst that brought a pleased grin to his broad features. Well, Fritz, Brown said, where's the old control? Fitzgerald fumed. I took over and explained swiftly. Well, this is a problem, Brown said thoughtfully. Now why in the world? His front door chimed and became one way transparent. We saw the alien standing on the stoop, erect and calm. Now what will? Fitzgerald started. We thought maybe the chair, Brownie. Brown grinned and pressed a button on the table console. He has them in every room to control at his whim any of the dozens of electronic and mechanical equipments located throughout his enormous house. The front door opened, and the alien entered as Brown cried, Come in! Brown flicked over a switch marked Lock First Floor as he rose and went into the living room. We followed him warily. The alien glanced back at the closed door with a trace of annoyance on his broad features then regarded us imperturbably as we advanced. "'Mr. Fitzgerald and Mr. Rainford,' he said flatly. "'Well, this is a surprise.' He didn't sound sincere. "'Have a seat,' Brown said, waving a big hand towards the chair. The alien shook his head negatively. Brown gave Fitzgerald and me a quick glance, inclining his head forward. We promptly accelerated our advance. Look, Brown said, his dark face intense, we know you're not what you pretend to be. We know you're not of our country, not of our world, not even our solar system. Sit down in that chair. He lunged forward, grasping with his big hands as we leapt at the alien from either flank. The alien didn't just move. He streaked, shooting between Brown and Fitzgerald, heading unerrily toward the open passenger shaft, into it. Brown leapt to a console and punched the roof-lock button. A split second later, we heard a riveting machine burst of what was obviously centaurian profanity coming down the shaft as the alien found the exit closed. Brown's fingers darted on the console, locking up all the upstairs windows. Brown, I said, what good will that do? If we do manage to corner him, just how long do you think we can stand up against him? With his speed, he could evade us until doomsday to say nothing about beating our brains out while we tried to land one solid punch. Fitzgerald said, If we can keep him on the run, maybe he'll get tired. Yeah, maybe, I said. What if that's his normal speed? And who's likely to get tired first? I'm dragging as of now. Well, Fitzgerald said, We could get more people in and go at him in shifts. Or, well, what about tear gas? or an anaesthetic gas, or... Now, wait, Brown snapped, unquestionably seizing command. I'll admit I started him on the run just now. Perhaps it was the wrong approach. After all, he's done nothing wrong as far as we know. I, I guess all of us, leaped to the illogical conclusion that he's out for no good just because he's an alien. Sure, he's after something, or he wouldn't be going from door to door posing as a census taker. The way you talk, Jim would seem to indicate you're not curious. But I am, and I'm going to do everything in my power to find out what he's after. We've got to make him tell us. We can't deduce anything from the data we have now. Sure, we know that he has what you, Jim, say look like bona fide credentials from the Census Bureau. But we also have right here ID papers or something which shows he's apparently from Alpha Centauri. We know he speaks a language perfectly, Ergo, he either learned it here first-hand, or acquired it from someone else who had learned it here. Whatever he's after, his approach certainly varies. He asked you a lot of questions, Fitz, but Jim, practically all he did in your house was tell you your wife was pregnant with quintuplets. And whatever his approach has been, he never seems to finish whatever he comes to do. Something about you two, and from what you two have said, Kozilak and Wall, seems to have a most peculiar effect on him. You say he staggered out of every house he's entered, only to recover again in a matter of seconds. Just try to equate that. He stopped, pondering, and we didn't interrupt. Look, he said, you two go upstairs, take opposite sides of the house and find him. Go slowly so that he won't be alarmed. Try to talk with him, to persuade him we mean him no harm. 
If you find you can't persuade him to come willingly, try to work him back to the passenger shaft. I'll watch with the console. I've kinescopes in every room, and I'll lock off one room at a time so that he can't reverse himself. I won't activate the kinescopes until you're upstairs. He might deactivate them if you weren't kept busy. Get him back to the passenger shaft, and I'll take over from there. But what? Fitzgerald started. Brown scowled, and we went. Fitzgerald should have known better. There are no buts when Brown gives orders. We reached the second floor, floated off the up column into the foyer, and separated. Brown's first floor rooms are spacious, but most of those on the second floor are not. I'd never been on the second floor before. I found it a honeycomb of interconnected rooms of various sizes and shapes. I was apparently in Mrs. Brown's quarters. There were half a dozen hobby rooms alone, a sewing room, a painting room, a sculpture room, a writing room, others. And here was a spacious bedroom, and on its far side the alien was vainly trying to force one of its windows. He turned as I entered, his curious eyes darting around for an avenue of escape. "'Now wait,' I said as soothingly as I could. "'We don't mean any harm. I think we're justified in being curious as to why you're here. Who are you, anyway? What are you looking for, and why?' He shook his head as if bewildered, and seemed suddenly to become unsteady. "'One question at a time, please,' he said temporizingly. "'Your school system isn't exactly enough. We all think of too many things at once. It shocks a mind trained to single-subject concentration, especially when one has been educated in telepathic reception.' He grinned at me as I mentally recalled his staggering moments of seeming drunkenness. One question at a time, he'd said. When I'd ask him the one that was burning at the threshold of my mind, I said quickly, I realise that you probably read in my mind that my wife and I are expecting quintuplets, but how did you know the rest, about the division of sexes? Or did you guess? I'll have to explain, he said, then hesitated, seeming to debate mentally with himself as to whether he should go on. Suddenly he started to talk so fast that the words nearly blurred into unrecognizability, like a 45 rounds per minute record at 78. "'I am Hurm Soleil of Alpha Centauri V, he burst. "'My people have warred with a race of Beta Centauri III for fifty of your years. "'We secretly bring our children here to protect them from sporadic bombing.' ensuring their upbringing through placing them in orphanages or directly into homes. A horrible suspicion flamed in my mind. I tried vainly to account for the multiple birth we were expecting. I cried at him, Then my wife! And he said, She will have twin girls, Doc Gardner tells me. We had planned to have three newborn boys ready in the delivery room. Then Doc Gardner... He and his staff are all of my race, Herm Soleil said. I see how your mind leapt when I said newborn boys. Your UFO sightings frequently describe a mother ship. Considering the gravid women aboard, I'd say the description is quite apt. For some reason, anger fled in me, and I rushed at him. He blurred and went around me, and out the way I'd come. I raced after him and heard Fitzgerald cry, "'Oh, no, you don't!' and machine-gun footfalls were doubling back toward me. I hurried on, and he flashed at and by me, then turned back as he came to a door Brown had remotely locked. Back at and past me again, I gave chase. Fitzgerald yelled, "'He's slowing down, Jim! He's tiring!' And the doors kept closing under Brown's nimble fingering at the control down below. Suddenly the area was cut down to the passenger shaft foyer, and the three of us were weaving about like two tackles after the fastest fullback of all time. I leapt forward, and actually laid a hand on the alien for a split second, just enough to topple him off ballast so that Fitzgerald, charging in, managed to bump him successfully into the shaft. A surprised cry came ringing back up the shaft, 
Brown has obviously cut the lift's power supply completely. Brown's voice came ringing up. Come on down, fellows. I've got him. The shaft guard light flicked to green. Fitzgerald and I dropped down to first. Brown had apparently had his chair directly under the shaft. It was back from the touchdown pad now, and Herm Soleil was in it, vainly wriggling, shame-faced. "'Now maybe we'll find out a thing or two, Brown said meaningfully, bending toward the alien. "'Wait a minute,' I cut in, and related what Herm Soleil had told me upstairs. "'Is it true?' Brown demanded. Herm Soleil nodded. "'But why are you going from door to door? Surely you know where those children are.' "'Sorry,' Herm Soleil said. "'We don't. Some of the older and more important records were lost. I say more important, because the missing ones I seek are grown. We're fighting a war, as I told you, Jim. You can't keep fighting a war without young recruits.' Brown's nearly fantastic dexterity came to my mind then. It apparently came to his simultaneously. He asked abruptly, "'Could I be one of you?' "'What do you think?' Herm Soleil countered, his face enigmatic. "'Well, I certainly can't move as fast as you.' "'Have you ever tried? Have you ever gone in for athletics?' "'I'd say no. Most scientists are essentially inactive, physically, that is.' "'Are you saying yes?' Brown cried. Herm Soleil looked us over, one by one. "'Each of you is of our blood,' he said. "'I knew Jim and Fitz were when Fitz said I was slowing down upstairs. "'I wasn't. "'They were speeding up to normalcy for the first time.' "'I was stunned for a moment, only dimly aware what he went on to say. "'Now please turn off this blasted chair and tell me how it works.' The principle applied as a tractor beam could win our war. "'I haven't the vaguest idea,' Brown said, "'but I bet you can figure it out.' Brown went to the servo mech for drinks. He was gone for precisely three seconds. Of those, the servo mech took two. Slow machine. "'I don't know what to tell Tessie. Maybe she'd feel strange with the boys if she knew.' I'll certainly have to tell her part of the truth, though, because I just can't let Brown and Fitzgerald go to help win our war without me. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Scapegoat by Richard Maples Originally published in Galaxy Science Fiction, June 1956. Narrated by Tom Trussell. Who would not have pity for a poor, helpless victim? Nobody, except another poor victim. The old guy didn't have a chance. All he could do was shield his head with limp arms and moan, while this other fellow, a young, husky six-footer, gave him a vicious, cold-blooded beating. "'Hey there!' I yelled indignantly. "'Cut it out!' But the kid kept belting away, as if he were methodically working out on a fifty-pound training bag. Finally, the old man sagged to the pavement, then this hoodlum began to kick him. "'I'm not a hero.' I'm a newspaper man whose job it is to look at things objectively, but I know right from wrong. My one punch caught the young bruiser back of the ear and spilled him on the ground. He lay there for a moment, then rolled over. Even by the street light, it was easy to see his eyes were glassy. It gave me lots of satisfaction. I'm not a big man, just compact, but I take care of myself. I don't drink or smoke, and I exercise regularly. The result is I can handle myself in the clinches. The kid sat up and pushed himself unsteadily to his feet. I could see now that he was a college boy. The red sweater with a cherry cloth border and the white pants with a shortened left leg were a dead giveaway. 
"'Listen here,' I said roughly. "'You nuts, beating up an old man!' He appeared to be desperately searching for an explanation, something to say. Then, abruptly, without having uttered a sound, he reeled away and shambled hurriedly down the street. My first inclination was to give chase, but the old man groaned and I turned to help him. That was when I had it, a virtual brainstorm. This whole episode, I could see, was a perfect answer to the damnable criticism levelled at my series on juvenile delinquency. More than that, it was an absolute vindication. Barely an hour ago, I had had to sit at a meeting and take it on the chin from twenty of the town's leading lights who designated themselves the Committee for the Protection of Youth. The outfit was, of course, politically inspired. It had obviously been started by the mayor and his gang as a means of torpedoing Jones, the publisher of my paper. Jones, you see, had become politically ambitious himself. Since I was the star on Jones's team, they piled on me. Some of the nicer things said about my articles were that they constituted filthy muckraking, were a pattern of irresponsible lies, and were designed principally to smear the incumbent politicos. The children of the town, they cried, were being sacrificed to ruthless ambition. It wouldn't have been so bad if Jones had stuck by me, but he cut and ran. Discretion, he had whispered to me from behind a pudgy hand, was the better part of valour. Then he told them he would discontinue the articles. Now I had first-hand proof of a particularly brutal bit of delinquency, a cruel assault on a poor, helpless old man. Furthermore, I was the hero of the incident. Bending down to see how seriously the old man had been hurt, I asked, "'What happened, Pop? Was he trying to rob you or something?' He didn't answer. I looked around for help, but the street was deserted. The best thing, I decided, was to take him home. There Nan, my wife, could patch him up while I found out what had happened. I bent down again and pulled him to his feet. He staggered. I put one steadying hand on his shoulder and gripped his wrist with the other. My spine went cold. It was his flesh. Not so much that it felt like rubber, but the chill. Here we were in the middle of a heat wave, the thermometer nudging ninety, and the old guy's wrist is like an icicle. For a second it threw me. Then I thought of shock. That might explain it, and Nan, having been a nurse, would be the one to know. I started the old man walking. See if you can make it to my house, I urged. It's just around the corner. Nan switched on the porch light when she heard us on the steps. Opening the door, she drew back with a little shriek. The old man was pretty gruesome looking at that, but it wasn't just his blood-covered face and matted white beard. There was something spiderish about him. It was angular and dark and skeletal. His eyes, deep-set and brooding, seemed to crouch under his shagging, jutting brows. "'Take it easy, honey,' I said. "'The old guy just needs some patching up.' She recovered quickly and helped him into the house. After we'd eased him into the easy chair by the fireplace in the living room, she turned to me, worried. "'Were you in an accident?' I gave her the story, and she looked at me sharply, but didn't speak. She went into the bedroom and came back with blankets and medicine bottles. Tucking the blankets around the old man's legs, she said, "'But I don't understand why you were walking. You went to the meeting in Jones's car. Why didn't he bring you back?' I didn't answer. The old man had closed his eyes, and his breathing was becoming very shallow. "'Look at him,' I said. "'Is he all right?' "'He's sleeping. Why don't you answer my question?' Jones didn't bring me home because I had words with him and walked away in a huff. "'Over the meeting?' Partly. I explained about the meeting and how Jones had backtracked when the going got rough. After all, it was his idea to build circulation with sensational articles and to use them to attack the present administration. But when there's a show done, he acts like a scared rabbit. 
and that's what I told him. I'm glad, Nan said, her face brightening. What did he say to that? He gave me a lot of bull about it being a mistake to pick on people's children, and how we should stick to old standbys like red light districts and dope trafficking. Nan slapped the iodine on the table. Some nerve! What did you tell him? I told him he was jerking the rug from under me, and that I'd be damned if I'd write a bunch of warmed-over tripe. Then I walked away. You finally quit! Until then, I don't think I'd ever realised just how much Nan hated my work. Of course, off and on, we'd really had some knock-down drag-outs, but I'd never considered them serious. Oh, we'd often talked about my going into teaching physical ed. It had been my intention ever since college. Some day I'd actually do it. I shook my head. No, honey, I didn't quit. But you're going to? I shrugged in a gesture of helplessness. How can I? An unprovoked attack against a poor old man is dynamite. It puts me in the driver's seat. I can write an article that will make every mealy-mouthed hypocrite who spoke against me tonight eat his words. The fire in her eyes died. It's always something, she said wearily. Year after year, you've come up with one reason or another to stay in that rotten business. And what does it amount to? Mudslinging. I'm beginning to think you like it. She'd never come out so bluntly. And deep down, I felt my resentment pressing like the sharp edge of a coiled spring. Originally, getting into the newspaper game had been a sort of fluke. Majoring in physical ed at college, I often covered the various sports events for the campus paper. One day, a big-time scandal broke involving gamblers and one of the teams, and I found myself in a perfect spot to do an exclusive for a city paper. My stuff was run verbatim under a byline and afterward picked up by the wire services. Later, with a trick knee help keeping me out of the war, I managed to talk myself into a job with a newspaper that had run my expose. I was goaded by a feeling that I ought to be doing something bigger than teaching children how to play games. From the very start, I discovered I had a peculiar talent. If I found myself anywhere near a skeleton in the closet, I could plainly hear its rattle. Before long, my reputation was firmly established. Nan, whom I would met at college, knew of my ambition to teach, and began planning towards that end as soon as we married. She started what she called a quitting fund. This was to stake a move to a small town where her uncle was principal of the high school. He was supposed to help me get a foothold in a new career. But then Tommy was born, and there were bills to pay. After that there were other reasons, like car payments. By the end of the war the teaching plans were no longer discussed, and Nan and I had drawn so far apart that even the bickering between us had ceased. Finally, when Tommy was about ten, she suddenly let me have it. It seems the kid was running around with a tough crowd. She wanted to get him away from the city. He needed the fresh air and the decent normal home life of a small town, she said, and she meant every word of it. Luckily, Jones had come along right about then and offered me a job on his newspaper, back in the old hometown. He had an idea he could drive the opposition paper out of business by featuring yellow journalism at the local level. That's where I came in. With my ability to make the news bleed, he figured he could cinch it. For that reason, he was willing to double my present salary. So I accepted. Nan, of course, was furious, even though I pointed out the extra dough meant we could start planning again. She didn't calm down until I promised to quit the job after six months. Yes, it was always something. She was right enough about that. But she had no right to make such an issue of things. I started to tell her that, then stopped. Maybe she was picking a quarrel to make me forget about the old man in the story. I threw a fast block into my resentment. Honey, I said, don't be unreasonable. Remember this job with Jones was supposed to get Tommy away from the city, and the extra dough was all part of that big plan for the teaching business. What plan, she fled. 
There never was a plan except to pamper your vanity. Big Shot Potter, the whiz-bang newspaper man. That's all you've ever been interested in. I had to take a deep breath to keep from yelling back at her. You're not being very fair about this. I did it all with you and Tommy in mind. Her voice lowered. Is that so? Well, how about the promise to quit in six months? We've saved the money. What marvellous thing do you have in mind for me and Tommy now? That hurt. As a matter of fact, I've been quite enjoying this stint with Jones. My series on juvenile delinquency had just about doubled circulation, and that gave me a deep sense of accomplishment. Then, too, writing this stuff against the mayor and the rest of the town's bigwigs, in keeping with Jones' political ambitions, nurtured a feeling of power that was very satisfying. Frankly, the meeting earlier that evening had set me down harder than I cared to admit. Now, with every chance for a comeback, Nan wanted me to pass. Listen, I snarled, so it's hot, so don't take it out on me. Her fists bunched, and the colour drained from her face. Knowing the signs, I could tell this was going to be a Lulu. But the door flew open, and Tommy came clumping through the hallway and into the front room. He's a big kid for his age, mentally and physically. He spotted the old man right away. Golly! he breathed excitedly. Who's the creep? Never mind, Nan said quickly, recovering her composure. He's had an accident. Just get some money from your father and go to the drugstore for more bandages. I'll need them. I gave him a buck, and he ran out to the kitchen way, slamming the back door so hard the whole house shook. The old man's eyes flickered open. He looked at me first, then at Nan. Well, he said in a peculiar, muffled tone that suggested he was speaking through an obstruction like a fencing mask. Isn't this cosy? I immediately threw a lot of questions at him. His name, he said, was Ash. Just plain Ash. He couldn't remember any other name. He couldn't remember why he'd been beaten up, nor what had led up to it. He was very confused. He thought maybe it would all come back to him later. However, he did remember my rescuing him, and he appreciated that very much. Hearing him say so gave me a nice tingling glow. I invited him to stay for dinner, and he accepted. Nan objected. There's only salad, she wailed. It was too hot to cook. Salad's fine, I told her. Oh, Ted, please. Listen here, I said coldly. I've invited Ash to stay, and he's accepted. Why all the fuss? She gave me a hurt look, turned, flounced into the kitchen. I started to follow, thinking I'd made a mistake in being so brusque. Then I thought, the heck with it. Let her take it any way she wanted. Sweat was plastering my shirt and pants to me like a skin diver's outfit. I needed a shower. I told Ash to rest easy and went into the bathroom. When I came out, Tommy had returned. He and the old man were busily gabbing. Nan, standing by the kitchen door, frantically signalled me to join her. In the kitchen she backed me against the sink. "'Get him out of here!' "'Why?' I asked, startled. "'There's something wrong with him.' "'Wrong? He gives me the willies!' "'It's just the heat,' I scoffed. "'If you must know, he, he leered at me while you were in the shower. It was awful!' "'Nan, do you think that kind of yarn is going to stop me from writing about what happened tonight? "'It won't, and you can make up your mind I'm keeping the job. "'When I get through with the people in this town, they'll know they've been dealing with Edward Potter.' "'Tight-lipped, she went to the refrigerator for the supper. "'As soon as we'd sat down, Ash began to talk. "'He kept it up through the entire meal. "'He'd been everywhere and done everything to hear him tell it.' Tommy, listening bug-eyed, kept asking questions. It sort of got me. The hero of the affair, to my own son, was Ash. It was Nan who finally blew the whistle. Mr. Ash, she said, her voice honed to a razor edge, I'm sure Ted would be much more interested in knowing what led up to the fight tonight, or are you still confused? There was a beat of three while he studied Nan carefully. 
then he said, "'It's quite apparent, Miss Potter, that you're absolutely no use for me. This shows discernment. Most likely, with a woman's instinct, you've hit upon at least part of the truth. Because of that, it might be wise to lay all my cards on the table. But I warn you, it will be hard to believe.' That, said Nan, leaning back with a gleam of triumph in her eyes, I'll bet on. It was hard to believe, all right, so hard, in fact, that I thought he was just pulling Nan's leg. He said he'd come from another world, outside our solar system, where people existed in a kind of liquid state, bouncing about, for the most part, like large water-filled bladders. They were, however, capable of taking almost any shape their superior minds willed. They could flatten and drift about in the water, or they could inflate and rise in the air. They could even become facsimiles of other living things, taking on the shape, texture and coloration, a capability which aided greatly in their main function of travelling as missionaries of goodness among the peoples of the galaxy. For they were perfect, as perfect as angels. As he talked, Nan's face got redder and redder. Finally, when I couldn't keep from snickering, she jumped up, grabbed her empty plate, and headed for the kitchen. "'Don't rush off, honey,' I said innocently. She stopped at the kitchen door and glared at me. "'I guess I know when I'm being kidded.' But, as Ash said in his cold, dry purr, "'I'm not kidding.' It seemed to me the joke had gone on far enough. "'Don't tell me,' I said sarcastically, "'that you are a missionary to earth.' "'No,' he admitted. "'I am here because I was banished.' "'Oh, a sort of fallen angel.' "'Exactly.' Another chill scurried along my spine. It was his tone of voice more than anything. But then, too, his eyes had a dull, black humorlessness about them. Nan returned to the table and sat down. I noticed a band of perspiration moustaching her upper lip. Indeed, I seemed to have grown much hotter myself. Irritably, I said, "'Ash, it's too damn warm for games. If you don't want to explain what's happened this evening, that's your privilege. But as you know, the story means a lot to me, and I did stick my neck out for you.' He held up a gnarled hand. "'One moment, my boy. Let me finish.' So he finished, and the rest of the story was even nuttier. He was a throwback, he said with quiet pride. The perfection which had taken his people countless years to attain was wiped out the moment he came into being. They tried to reform him, but there was something fundamental about his evil, as if it were an essence. As a last resort, they had put him into one of the wonderful machines and thrown the switch. At that agonising instant he would imagined himself to be water scraping over the edge of a sharp rock. Then he would come to, drifting through space. And much later he would touched earth. Once landed, he would taken on many shapes through the years, mainly, however, of people who died. Even as he talked, I was carefully sliding my chair back. If I could reach the phone in the hallway without being noticed, it would be fairly simple to get help. But he saw what I was doing and laughed. Edward, he said, I know you don't believe me, but stick around until I prove it. What happened next almost made me sick to my stomach. His face, which had been wrinkled as a fielder's mitt, all of a sudden took on the appearance of a disturbed reflection in a pool of water. His flesh began to writhe like a tangled mass of earthworms. Thirty seconds after it began, he had sloughed off thirty years. Even his beard, which had been as white as shower-room tiling, became a fierce dead black. I heard Tommy pipe, Golly! and Nan sigh, only it sounded more like a groan. I shook away the dazed feeling, and it was immediately replaced by a great excitement. "'Listen here,' I said hoarsely. "'This story will set the whole country on its ear, with my byline on it.' "'Oh, Ted!' Nan cried. "'Don't let him take you in. It's a trick. 
It's mass hypnotism or something. The trouble with you, I said, is you don't even believe even what you see with your own eyes. The next day I went to see Jones. We decided, Ash and I, upon a course of action. The existence of Ash was to remain a secret, but I was to keep my job with the paper at all costs. When we could sit back and wait for the opportune moment to spill it, a time when we had the best angle and were positive Ash wouldn't be labelled as a hoax. Driving to the plant, I was tense enough to snap. It was not entirely from the unabated heat, either. I didn't like the way Ash had acted during the latter part of the evening. Naturally, I had felt disappointment at not being able to reveal his presence. But what rankled most was the guy's colossal gall. OK, so I'm childish, only I just don't like to have someone gobble up my share of the dessert. He'd also borrowed all the cash in the house and then demanded I draw on my bank account. I quickly discouraged that. But the topper was his forcing Nan and me to sleep on the couch while he used the bed. He said his bruises still hurt, even though they weren't visible. My mood didn't improve when Jones kept me waiting for over an hour. Surprisingly enough, he was in good spirits. As I entered the office, he indicated one of the leather chairs and sat, said with a laugh, "'Sit down, Ted. I've got some good news.' My opinion of him the previous evening obviously hadn't been taken very much to heart. Sourly, I told him, "'As a publisher, you should know that good news is no news.' A smile left his face. Then, with a visible effort, he forced it back. "'You have something there, Ted. You certainly have.' But point of view is important also. You see, they've arrested a gang of kids for shoplifting. One of them is Tommy, your son. I jumped up. Arrested Tommy? Now wait, Ted. Don't go off all half-cocked. It's a break. Don't you see? You can cover delinquency with a lid off now. You'll be writing as a parent in the same boat with other parents. I could still hear his frantic noises after I slammed the door behind me and run the length of the corridor. At the police station I had the distinct feeling they had been waiting for me. I knew most of them, especially the big red-headed guy who had beckoned me into the rear office. His name was Thompson, Detective Emmanuel Thompson. He always looked as if he wore a football uniform under his dark blue suit. My articles had roasted him plenty. He handled juvenile delinquency cases. "'Well, Mr. Potter,' he greeted me, smiling tightly, "'we meet under unfortunate circumstances.' "'Can the phone is sympathy,' I said. "'You're not the type. Just let me see my boy.' He used a red and blue handkerchief to wipe the dampness from his beefy neck. "'I think we'd better have a little talk first. "'I got no talking to do.' This is a lousy frame-up against me and the paper. Get my son out of here and do it fast. He put the handkerchief away, sighed, and reached for the phone. It really got me when Tommy came into the room. He had been crying. His face was streaked, and he looked scared and forlorn. Son, I said, finding it difficult to keep the rasp out of my voice. If you've got a hat, put it on, and let's go. Thompson pulled out his handkerchief again and carefully lowered himself into the chair behind the desk. "'You don't seem to understand, Mr. Potter. Your boy is in trouble. He's been identified as leading a gang of kids who spent most of the morning shoplifting in stores all over town.' "'That's bull,' I said. "'How could my boy do a thing like that? He's only twelve. Who identified him anyway?' "'The shopkeepers and the other members of the gang.' For one awful moment I felt a great cavity of doubt. Son, I asked, what's all this about? Tommy's face creased with fear and tears brimmed his eyes. It was Ash, he quavered. Ash? Yes. I told him about the gang. Gang? The Red Skulls. What the heck are you talking about? Some of the fellows got together and built a hut for a clubhouse over on the garbage dump. We call ourselves the Red Skulls. I was made leader. I'm called the Skullcap. 
Why haven't I heard about this? You never asked, Dad. I tried to tell you one night, but you were hurrying to get that road house on the turnpike. You said you had a big lead on juvenile delinquency. Well, you certainly didn't try very hard, I said angrily. What was this gang's purpose? Oh, different things. One of the fellows has a point twenty two, and we hunt rats. Then— Go on. That's all. You started to say something else. He kicked at the floor. Oh, gee. Let's have it. We smoked. Smoked. He nodded. And what else? That's all honest. Thompson said. What about shoplifting? No, snivelled Tommy. That was Ash. He wanted me to talk the gang into shoplifting, but I wouldn't. Then he changed himself to look like me and talked the fellows into it when I wasn't around. I only know about it because I ran into them after they'd been in a store. Thompson gave me a funny look. Who's this Ash he keeps talking about? I started to tell him. Then I got a sudden mental flash of how idiotic it would all sound. The boy, I said evenly, is beside himself because of all he's been through. It's time to call a halt to this farce. I'm going to hire myself some legal talent. He shrugged. Suit yourself. Tommy grabbed my arm and cried, Please don't leave me, Dad. I pulled away from him, feeling as if I'd dropped him off a cliff. Right outside the station I met Nan. She was pale and breathless. Jones had phoned the news. She wanted to go to Tommy immediately. I guided her to the car and pushed her inside. "'Listen here,' I said tensely. "'For once, don't make a fuss. Just help me find Ash. He's the one who can free Tommy.' She began to laugh. "'That's a hot one,' she gasped. "'That's really a hot one.' I shook her, thinking she was hysterical. She stopped laughing and swallowed hard. "'Ash is home.' "'Home? Blind drunk, with a brond on his knee.' I tramped so hard on the accelerator that it must have scraped the ground all the way home. Ash didn't hear me pull up to the house because the radio was going full blast. I hit the light switch in the hallway, and the brightness flared against the lengthening afternoon shadows, spotting him and the blonde on the living room couch. The blonde looked as if she'd come from a burlesque runway. Ash dumped her on the floor and staggered to his feet. he changed his appearance again. Now he looked a strikingly handsome twenty-five. He came forward to throw a heavy arm around my shoulder. "'Glad to see you, Ted,' he mouthed. "'Ran out of money. Must have more. Small loan.' I put both hands on his chest and pushed. He stumbled back and thudded against the wall. "'The police have picked up Tommy,' I said flatly. "'He's been charged with the shoplifting you did today.' He sobered instantly. He jerked the blonde to her feet, booted her out, slammed the door, and came back to me. "'Ted, I'm shocked to hear this. Tell me about it quickly. We must do something right away.' The blonde had begun to howl and scream curses. I could hear doors and windows opening all the way down the street. "'You monster!' Nan spat and hurried outside. Presently the girl quieted down. "'Ted!' Ash whispered. "'I'm ashamed of myself.' Here you befriended me, and all I've done is get you and your family in trouble. He held a cupped hand over his eyes as if he were shading tears. Can you possibly find it in your heart to forgive me? I was moved. After all, a poor homeless alien being couldn't very well be expected to understand our manners and feelings. Yet this one did. All because he'd been touched by my friendship. Ash, I said, feeling the warmth of goodwill. I'm happy to hear you say that. Bygones are bygones. The important thing is springing Tommy. Exactly, he said. We'll go and explain everything to the police, but we'll do it in grand style. This is your big show. We must have Jones and the mayor. We must have photographers, reporters, television, radio, everything. Nan returned. The girl will be all right. She was just upset. Honey, I told her excitedly, we're about to stand the whole country on its collective ear. Ash is going to reveal his identity. Nan's face pinched into a look of disgust. 
You mean you're trusting this this creature again? Sure, honey, anyone can make a mistake. That's right, she exploded. You're making one now. Oh, Ted, stop being such a fool. Listen here, I said. This is the last two minutes of the game. We're trying to score before the gun, and you start an argument. She began to blubber. Why must she always be so unreasonable? Why the constant bickering and tension and unhappiness? I was sick to death of it. I grabbed Ash's arm. Come on, I said, let's go. Even outdoors, the air felt hot and clammy. I headed the car for the plant, figuring I could do my phoning from there as well as pick a crew. But on Main Street, Ash spotted a cab and made me stop. He said he'd better go on ahead. He thought things would work smoother that way. He could start the ball rolling on the release of Tommy, and I wouldn't be held up by having to tell people who he was. I drove on alone, but it was a mistake. People simply didn't believe my story about an alien being. In various ways and tones of voice, they all suggested I go home and sleep it off. In desperation, I went up to Jones's house, even though he'd already told me on the phone that he was in the middle of a dinner party. He came up close to me and sniffed my breath. Don't worry, I told him. I never touch it. But maybe I should smell yours. Anyone who turns his back on the biggest story of all time must be drunk. He jerked the cigar from his mouth and gave me a narrow-eyed, searching look. Ted, I just hope for your sake this isn't some kind of a joke. Fifteen minutes later, we pulled up to the police station in a three-car convoy, with a big crew from the paper. I led the group inside, feeling the excitement grow in me. I marched up to the desk sergeant. Where is he? The desk sergeant looked startled. Who? Well, he wasn't there. He just wasn't there. It was like getting tackled two yards from a touchdown by a tackler you hadn't realised was anywhere near. Jones pushed forward, chewing agitatedly on his cigar. Edward, you've got some nerve putting a stunt like this. It's an outrage. Take it easy, I said weakly. Something's gone wrong. It certainly has. You must have gone insane. Listen here, if you don't stick with me on this, I'm all through with the paper. That suits me fine. I watched him leave, trailing cigar smoke. The others followed. My face burned and sweat trickled down my back and along my sides. I wanted to hit out at something. A hand gripped my elbow. It was Sergeant Thompson. Mr. Potter, you shouldn't let this get you down. People's kids get in scrapes all the time. Tomorrow you'll have a talk with a judge and everything will turn out okay. I jerked my elbow away. In other words, you think I'm batty too. No, he said, gripping my elbow again and starting me toward the door. It's been hot and you just need some rest. Thompson, I said, dragging myself to a halt. I know it sounds nuts, but this Ash character really exists. Help me find him and you can cut yourself a slice. It'll be big time. The grip on my elbow increased. Go home, Mr. Potter, and get a good night's sleep. But it's on the level, Thompson. Jones and I busted up. I'm playing on your team now. His face got all flushed. My job isn't a game and I don't belong to any team. Get wise, will you? Stay in your own backyard for once. It could stand a lot of weeding. He pushed me out the door then, so hard I almost fell. Standing there, feeling the heat press in on me, I tried to dope out the next move. My car was still at Jones's place, so I'd need a cab. I turned toward the drugstore at the end of the block where I could phone. Walking along, I recalled Ash had taken a cab earlier in the evening. If I could talk to the driver, I might get a lead on his whereabouts. I walked faster. I thought of Thompson and his remark about the backyard. And the weeds. Again, for the third time, a chill travelled the length of my spine. I began to run. I ran past the drugstore and all the way home. They were both in the bedroom. Nan stood in the far corner with her back against the wall. Her shoulders were scratched and her lip cut. She held a heavy bookend poised to strike at Ash, who was in front of her, moving stealthily forward. The moment I spun him around, 
I froze in amazement. I couldn't recognize him. Then, all at once, I realized I was looking at the spitting image of myself. He broke from my grasp and darted to the window. Before I could follow, Nan had dropped the bookend and flung herself into my arms. "'Oh, Ted!' she sobbed. "'I knew it wasn't you!' I kissed her and gently disengaged her arms. "'I've got to get Ash,' I said. When I vaulted through the window and circled the house, I spotted him rushing down the street. I caught him around the corner at the same spot where I'd first seen him. I slugged him. Yet I knew it was useless the instant the blow landed. He felt just like sponge rubber. But I kept hitting him. I didn't bother listening to his cries, and I didn't give a damn that he'd changed himself back to an old man. The blow on the back of my neck was so sudden I didn't feel it. The only sensation was unbalanced, as if I was walking uphill. Then I was slapped with a sidewalk. Looking up, I could see he was young, clean-cut, and well-built. His long, horsey face was furious. "'You crazy!' he yelled. "'Beating up an old man!' I searched desperately for an explanation, something to say. Then, abruptly, without having uttered a sound, I reeled away and shambled hurriedly down the street. Home to Nan. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.